Hi everyone, welcome back to our second artist talk. My name is Adeline and I oversee the shop at the Gardner Museum. You will notice that your mics and videos are muted and the chat option has been disabled. However, there will be a quick Q&A following today's conversation and so we invite you to send us questions through the Q&A function at any point. Please note that this program is being recorded and live streamed with closed captioning. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that Toronto is located on the treaty lands and ancestral territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, the Pitoon, and the Mississaugas of the Credit Nation. The community we work in is a home to many Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to learn and live on this land. Today, we are very excited to welcome artists Danielle Skensos, Jason Sheetal, and Aita Trianakin, hosted by Barbara Banfield, ceramist and founder of the Fusion Creative Directions Program. They will be discussing how their mentorship with Angelo DePetta guided their creativity and the refinement of their works. I will now turn off my video and mic and hand it over to Barbara. Good afternoon to everyone who has been able to take the time out of their busy day to join us. This is uh, the second or part two of a chat with the artist whose work is currently on display in the exhibition Cultivate in the uh, Garden Museum shop. Each of the artists that you will meet today uh, participated in the Creative Directions Mentorship Program with Angelo DePetta. Um, this was delivered through Fusion, the Ontario Clay and Glass Association over the last two years. Um, interestingly enough, Angelo was one of the very first mentors that we had back in uh, 2011. More than a decade ago, I graduated from uh, Sheridan College in Ceramics. And as I spent time setting up my studio and um, working away lonely, I realized how much I missed my colleagues and the community that had supported me so much while I was at school. Um, I joined the Fusion Board. I joined several board, uh, guilds. But really what I felt was missing was that um, honest critique and the feedback, that instant feedback when you asked a classmate, what do you think, um, that kind of stimulated an idea or a thought. So um, it was sort of through the Fusion Board and with their support, um, as well as the Ontario Arts Council and many other arts organizations, um, we were able to design and deliver the first Fusion Mentorship Program, as I mentioned back in 2011. Um, over the last 11 years, Fusion has delivered seven mentorships and three creative directions programs. Um, these two programs differ slightly, but um, are intended for the artists to sort of find their voice. So basically what happens is um, an individual applies to be part of the group. Um, they commit to work over a period of a, a year to a year and a half. Um, and with this case, it was almost two years. Um, with the intention of either refining a body of work uh, that might be in its infancy or uh, an opportunity to just completely forge all new directions. Um, and you will see that what is generated by these artists who take on this commitment and engage in this kind of creative journey leads to some pretty uh, strong work. And you will see that reflected in these um, presentations and in the exhibition Cultivate. The mentor who uh, guided this group, Angela DePetta, is an artist himself, artist himself and a renowned teacher who began his career in 1975 at OCAD. Not only is he accomplished in his own right as an artist and an educator, but he has a unique ability to draw out of others sometimes what they can't see within themselves. I think he also um, is very good at giving a little push when needed. The focus of this particular program was to consider the design qualities and the criteria for developing functional ceramics. This design investigation was the foundation for the new work or the refinement of the pieces that you will see in this exhibition. Today, we are very excited to have three artists that have completed the Fusion Creative Directions Mentorship with Angelo, Danielle Skensos, Jason Schneedl, and Ekta Trinicus. I know you will find each of these presentations uh, very informative and inspirational. If you have questions, please um, put them in the Q&A function and we will address them at the end. Enjoy. I am going to hand it over now to Danielle. Hi, 
Hi. Just going to get my screen shared here. Okay, so I'm Danielle Skensos, and um, also known as Julie Pottery, I should mention. <laughs> and I guess I would describe my journey to getting to this place in my work as uh, taking the back roads. <laughs> so I grew up on a farm in Oromodonti, and uh, my hands were always in the dirt. But my exposure to ceramics was pretty limited in a smaller area. Um, I guess my, my only exposure would have been high school in grade 10. We did a little bit of hand building. Um, so I continued on in school. Um, I ended up uh, really enjoying art, but I dropped all my art courses to continue taking enough math and science to go on and get a degree in health sciences at the University of Western. And even while I was there, my electives were limited because of my course load, but I worked for the University of Western doing anatomical drawings for one of my professors for, to, for her to use in her courses. And so I always kind of tried to keep that creative outlet open. Um, after my degree in health sciences, I moved to Australia uh, to get a concurrent degree in education and a master's in teaching. And um, when I moved back from Australia, my soon-to-be husband and I, we moved to Toronto for his work. Um, and it was at that point that there was a, a little divergence. I was teaching at a small school in Leaside. And as I was driving home, I would always kind of take the uh, little back roads instead of the main road. And I noticed a sign on someone's front lawn saying pottery lessons and signed up. So I ended up taking some semi-private pottery lessons from someone named Joan Kagan and thoroughly enjoyed my time with Joan. She was a retired high school teacher and loved pottery. And so she kind of provided me with those basics and also the encouragement to keep going. So, and I, I believe she had to throw me out every week at the end of that three hour session. So when um, Nick and I decided to move back to Simcoe County, she, Joan was really the person who encouraged me to keep my hands in clay. And she suggested, uh, since I was teaching and had a bit of time in the summer, to uh, continue learning through the Halliburton School of Art. Um, and I did. I just need to switch my screen here. Okay, so here's um, some of the things that I began at the Halliburton School of Art. I studied under Michael Sheba for a few courses, um, taking his Raku course and all who also um, the glazed chemistry courses and I really enjoyed Michael's detail and attention attention to all those details I think my science background kind of really helped me in that area so the top left um, is a base using the halo effect which I really surprisingly it was a Raku course but that was my one that was the favorite. Um, and on the right, I have some impressed field flowers with a crackle glaze. And then the bottom left is a vase that I made after because I think taking other people's courses when you're not the expert is a wonderful way to just kind of bring out the play in your work. So, um, you try new things, you don't expect to sell them. It, it just allows for a little more creativity, I think. And um, I've really enjoyed taking courses whenever I can. So this slide is showing some of my functional work. Uh, it was about 2009 
um, that we had like moved back to Simcoe County and I was starting to create more work than I could keep. <laughs> so I applied for a few dirt shows. I think um, my rural roots were my inspiration for that functional wear, things that you use every day, uh, like cups and mugs and tea sets and things like that. I, I look back now, so at that time I thought this is a like this is a pivot in my work. And my first jury show, I had a booth set up at um, in Barrie and Aurelia. At first, it was the uh, Mariposa Folk Festival, and then it was Kemp and Fest. And I had a booth, but in the back was a little playpen for my almost one-year-old son. And I was also pregnant with my second. <laughs> so, um, you know, looking back now, I kind of giggle thinking that I was going to do all this pottery, but essentially the next nine or 10 years of my life were devoted to raising three little boys and, and not much pottery occurred during that time. I was teaching full time still and um, spending time with my kids. So there was a big pause other than just making things for family and friends. When my youngest began school in 2018, I began teaching half time to pursue clay on a more serious basis. And uh, I spent the first year of that time, much of it, you know, developing some glazes that were very simple and forms that had clean, clean lines that I would like to use in my own house. Um, I also began fixing up, I have a basement, I had a basement room, I would call it a basement room, but I began fixing it up in the hopes because I so enjoy teaching to have students come in and enjoy play as well. Uh, so I began fixing up my studio to reflect my aesthetic and also keep it tidy for other people. Here you can see like I just purchased a simple countertop that was on sale. So I'll go back, a simple countertop that was on sale at my local hardware store. And I used two by fours underneath. Uh, with a plywood shelf to store my glazes that I make and my glaze materials. And then above, I have a shelf for some of my purchased glazes and books and things like that. Also, um, you can see like some furniture that has been <laughs> given to us uh, from parents or uh, has been incorporated into my studio as well. Uh, this next shot just shows like one area of my studio included a pegboard so that because it's a small space, I'd say it's probably about 12 feet by 20 with a little bump out where that countertop was. Um, but there's once the shelves start filling up, there's not heaps of space. So it was nice to, you know, incorporate things on the wall to keep them up and out of the way. It's also easy if I have students for them to be able to find things and a good excuse to keep things clean and tidy. <laughs> and here's just an, a shot from farther away that night, sorry about that reflection, but um, I have a few standard Shimpo wheels in my studio as well as I purchased um, a tabletop version for anyone who has issues with their bags or if I want to go do a workshop somewhere. But generally, a lot of the stuff in the studio is used. So other than the wheels, like the shelving, the sink, even the slab roller, I just kind of kept an eye out on Kijiji, our local Kijiji, and over those years purchased things slowly. Um, to build the studio that I have. Oops, sorry. Okay, so this next slide, when Angelo first asked us um, to make an inspiration board, I really started at home. And um, 
I explored like my farm. My parents' farm is just on the back of our property. We built right next to them. <laughs> and so I spent time with my kids walking around the farm and looking at the old things that existed there. Um, I also remembered that I had in my grandmother's cedar chest, I had a book and it's curious as to why she would have kept it, but it, it was this little yellow book on Ontario weeds and it had really beautiful line drawings in it. So it, uh, things started to kind of sprout from there as to where my inspiration was coming from. This bottom picture in the center, that was my grandparents' farm and my grandmother's handwriting. Uh, it says 1952. And it's just so, I just find it so interesting the history of the community coming together to build such amazing structures. At the beginning, I was very interested in screen printing. So I thought I might print on clay and experimented with that a little bit. Um, our neighbor, Mel Modgley, who owns my parents' farm, he had gone around all of Simcoe County photographing old barns that in all likelihood won't be standing for forever. So they're trying to document them before they're gone. And I sat down with him and he shared pictures and stories about barn raisings and of course, I was very curious about the meals and what people ate off of. So he informed me that generally it would be a large lunch served on a variety of uh, dishes from everyone's home. So everyone who was there helping build, their families would bring and contribute to that big warm lunch. And he said there was always an abundance of pie and tea. So initially, I thought maybe I will, um, you know, include pie dishes and definitely, you know, be began to be steeped in that idea of creating a tea set. Uh, so here, I was just screen printing pictures of my grandparents' barn and then carving some of the lines in there. My first iterations of the mugs, I basically just made a, a bunch of cylinders to start and it helped me gauge my interest in each different technique. Um, I was looking for, you know, that aged patina. So I started with some slip and some printing, um, but I wanted it to look like old granary boards we have in our house. And, an old greenery board where we measure our kids' height. And I loved the look of that paint that's all being worn off. So I started looking at that. Initially, my handles um, were black. I wanted, I wanted um, that look of industrial. So usually the handles that I'd made before then were pulse. And even you can see in the left picture there, the spout in the teapot, I, I preferred throwing them, but I eventually moved to hand building to get more of an aged look out of them. Thinking through the feeling of a cup to your mouth, you can see some of the slip in that right picture. Uh, it was going all the way up to the top, but I eventually banded the top and bottom with glaze so it would feel nicer to your lip. Um, and I just was really experimenting. Here, I would say my two processes that benefited me the most in making such a different type of pottery than I'd made before was using paper templates. Um, I was really able to figure out my color choices and also get a general sense of my carvings. Um, so I could look at them separately, but then I could also Span those paper uh, templates out and see what it would look like as a landscape or as a whole set. So that helped me um, narrow things down and it saved me heaps of time um, in my process. I also 
I also use miniature forms. So I like drawing really small bud bases and things like that. So when I started doing this, I, I considered, you know, teapots are such a lot of work. <laughs> what if I could make them small and quicker and just see if I like the look of them before making them bigger? And so you see on the right there, there's a couple teapots that are, you know, smaller than my mugs. And it really helped me get an idea of what do I want the handle to look like? What do I want other things to look like? Sorry, I think someone might be using the garage door below me. I eventually settled on using these vertical lines here. And it allowed me to separate my palette into two areas one that could show you know farm imagery and one that could show some fields and things like that and um i banded the bottom and the lid with um imagery you know those lines that replicate a silo so that helped and here is some of my finished work where the handles became more refined I found a glaze that more replicated that rusty iron look. And here, um, some of the flowers, this is just the same mug turned. So I really hope that my work showed, like I was trying to find that um, line of appreciation of our natural world, you know, and um, I recently read a book called Braiding Sweetgrass by Robin Wall Kimmerer, and there was a line that stood out to me when she described the smell of humus or earth is like a bonding, um, has a bonding effect or a physiological effect on people. And so I don't know if I knew that as a fact, but I think I felt it growing up on farm and I just appreciate that so much. So this work, I, I think, reflects that looking back at it now. I just wanted to mention quickly um, that, you know, the Creative Directions program was more than I could have imagined. It was really great to learn from Angelo. He was super excellent as a teacher. And um, he asked that we had meaning in our work. And I think, all of the artists met at and the fellow artists were just easy to work with and encouraging and we were all able to be you know vulnerable but also get that critical feedback that Barb was talking about which was probably the best part of this that community building um, and when the world stopped uh, during our process um, we were accountable to each other so that was great. I would also like to thank Adeline and Gardner Museum Shaw for the continual support um, and their advice during, you know, our installation and everything being virtual and obviously Richard for helping too with all of these technical issues and sharing things virtually. And finally to Fusion, you know, as and especially to Barb. Um, as a mom and someone who lives in a rural area, it's really difficult to um, find continuing education. So this was such a good growth opportunity. And um, I think after this year and a half process, I look forward with intention to what's ahead and I'm okay with it being the back roads. I think COVID has taught us that a lot can be offered from a distance as well. So that's wonderful. Thank you for listening. And now I'm going to stop sharing and hand this over to Jason Sheedle. Hey there. All right. 
Hi, everybody. I'm happy to be here to share a snapshot of my Creative Directions experience. Um, preparing for this talk has been a great opportunity for me to process and reflect. Uh, there's a lot to unpack, and I hope I can give a sense of the uh, extent of the growth uh, that was brought about by this mentorship. So a little bit about my background. Hmm. Okay. Um, I'm relatively new to clay. This is a photo of me in 93. Uh, I graduated from the Ontario College of Art and I studied in a sculpture installation program. Uh, I loved it. It was a great program. I had amazing teachers. My one regret is that I never did a ceramics elective. Um, and after this, I went on to do a master's degree in sculpture from Cranbrook Academy of Art in Michigan. And the reason I mention this is that, as I think you'll see, sculpture is always on my mind. And this has been both a blessing and a curse in working with clay. Um, I think in the long run, it'll serve me well, but my learning curve has been quite steep, you know, not having a more traditional ceramics foundation. I first worked with Angelo in 2018. Uh, I heard his name at the Fusion Conference in Waterloo and I looked him up and I did a week long mold making and model making intensive at his Millbrook studio. And it was a really thorough grounding in the subject that set me up for success in the projects <clears throat> that I had imagined up until that point. And uh, I went home and I immediately drove all my models to the dump <laughs> and my molds to the dump and I redesigned my studio and I started over again. So here are some examples of early work that came out after that week, this is kind of the beginning for me. And I wanna point out just a couple of features here. Uh, you'll see modular components that are cast separately and joined together. And I think as I get more into my talk, you'll see how this idea of a composite form develops further through the mentorship of Creative Directions. And the other feature is the use of um, ceramic stain in the slip as a means of coloring the work as opposed to glazing. So the creative directions process, as I remember it, you know, we began with a review of kind of fundamental design principles so that we all had a shared vocabulary. We were all on the same page. Uh, and then Angelo encouraged interior reflection and the development of personal iconography as a guide. So at the beginning, it's a little like feeling around in the dark was that was the way it was for me. Um, and we were asked to do both written and visual research into our areas of interest. So I'm going to share now some phrases that I wrote along with images that were pinned to my wall in the studio at the time. And to be mindful of time, I'm gonna move through these quite quickly. Uh, synthetic nature. So we were asked to look to nature for inspiration, but I have a complex relationship to nature. And I, so I came up with the term synthetic nature, was something I kind of gravitated more towards. And this is a, these are some simple renderings that I made using 3D design software, as was my habit before this mentorship. That changed quite a bit. Hybrid bodies. So here are pictures of wrestlers that I was looking at. And I'm interested in how they meet and intertwine. And I'm trying to consider a way to make an object with the characteristics of bodies and interaction. Artificial life, a sense that the world we've created has taken on a life of its own. Mutation, I love this. Uh, this is a voguing here. And I, I remember how the dancers spoke of uh, breaking the traditional lines of the body. Splitting and fusing. This is a sculpture by John Chamberlain. Uh, an American artist is made of um, crushed and painted car parts. So here you're seeing something being made out of multiple fragments coming together. Integrated fragments. So here I'm asking, how am I going to make these impulses into something that's viable with clay? And so here's a, a sketch of something that kind of feels like it's bundled together. It's bulging a bit at the seams. I have more drawings that follow. 
Composites and Parasites. This is a, an example of a ready-made artwork by Kelly Jasvac. Um, her plastic, plastic glomerate objects were of uh, found uh, debris that washed up on shore. So plastic fusing with sand, shells, and other natural materials, which is evidence of the Anthropocene. Tipping point. Uh, looking back at 2019, there's a mounting sense uh, that we were on a tipping point in history. And I, I can think of, you know, Greta Thunberg is obviously a, a, a great uh, representative of uh, calling our attention to the urgency of the crisis that we're currently in. And yet at the same time as Greta Thunberg was trying to share her message, there is evidence of overproduction and excess as exemplified here in these Balenciaga dad shoes that I kind of have a love-hate relationship with and I'm um, very interested in this. And then some more from the world of fashion. And I have the phrases surface over surface, skin over skin, and mask over mask. Um, these are all images from a runway show for Maison Margiela by John Galliano. Uh, who spoke of designing for digital natives. And you see collage here, multiples, layers, fusing as well. And I have the impression here that if I were to peel away these layers, there's nothing underneath the layers, but more layers as well. So, <laughs> you know, these are the things I'm looking at and considering. And the, the burning question is how do you translate this into ceramics? So here I am sketching. These are some early uh, notebook drawings. A very crude a ballpoint pen, a notebook paper. I'm trying to translate some of the ideas, some of the feelings. You can see these forms kind of coming together. And in this one, maybe it's more obvious how it's kind of moving more towards a vessel. And here I am printing some 3D models. And this was my habit that I had developed before I did this mentorship, um, which you know, produces some interesting results, but problematic as well. So here's a real nugget. Uh, I consider this to be almost like a Zen cone that I heard. And when Angelo first used this quotation, I, I have to admit, I didn't really understand what it meant. Um, and that was a, it was interesting. I sat with it for a while. Think of form, think not of form, but of forming. You know, I used it as kind of a mantra and it started to shake loose some of my sculpture habits, uh, my blind spot. The creative directions made me aware that my tendency was to think of form over forming and you know, thus that led to a lot of frustration with me working with ceramics because successful working with clay is always grounded in an understanding of process. And I think that's what this phrase means. Clay is a very humbling material and it can't be forced to do something it's not inclined to do. So a consideration of process is always paramount. And Angela was asking the questions as well, could this be formed another way? You know, does it call for hand building? Does it call for um, mold making? Um, and what would be the most efficient way of doing things? So I realized at that point that uh, my default setting had been 3D printing and that was a, a problem. Uh, so it was kind of bye-bye to 3D printing for me. You know, I had a, a conversation with Angela one night after um, our, our meeting and um, he pointed out that 3D printing was expensive and it was oftentimes wasteful and it was way slower than working with traditional model making materials like clay and plaster. So he encouraged me to try and use something less expensive uh, to kind of use some tried and true methods to gain traction on my projects. So here you see me returning to some of my you know, older training um, and I'm, I'm modeling with uh, Clay, refining the form of ribs, uh, working quite quickly. I'm using waste molding. Um, this is one half of a waste mold here. Um, 
So the waste mold is good because it allows you to move quickly from a clay prototype into something in plaster, which is a harder material. You can refine it further with uh, ribs and sandpaper and files. Here's some examples of my models. They have pencil lines on them here because I've was kind of sketching ideas for in my casting process. And I'll just move really quickly through the casting process, how that works. Um, so I, I would make multiple piece molds for slip casting. Here I'm kind of trying to keep everything square and level, being conscious of the, the way the form is situated within the mold and how the, all of the pieces will retract. The, the black lines indicate the parting lines. Here I've cast one side of this object and I'm getting ready to do another. And that's a finished model and mold set getting ready to use. So how slip casting works, just to be really quick about that, um, you have a mold, which is a void and plaster is made of plaster and plaster is thirsty. So when you pour slip into it, it begins to suck the moisture out of the clay, depositing a fine wall along the surface of the mold. Um, which then becomes the finished work. Um, and the way that I've used it here is that I uh, mix ceramic stain into the casting material. So as, instead of just going towards glazing, I'm embedding the color in the work. And in this instance here, I'm scoring it with a knife. Once it sets up to a certain firmness, I'm peeling it away, uh, joining the mold together pouring in the backing slip. And uh, I like in these finished works how it gives the impression of being, they, they have the impression of being dressed from within. So you can see I'm a big fan of color, or you will see I'm a big fan of color and uh, I developed a color library. I tested over 30 colors to see how they would survive at cone six. And uh, probably about a third of them did not make it. And then I try to be playful with casting. You know, I, I, when I would do a piece, I would try and reinvent it as much as I could every time. I would cut into the slip, I would brush it, layer it, pour it, manipulate it, kind of treating the mold as a blank canvas thinking of color as a structuring device instead of as a decorative element. And so here are some works that came out of the mentorship. This is a few different views of the same object. Um, of course, you never really know what you're going to get when you're casting until the piece comes out of the mold, which is part of the pleasure of that process. Um, Clearly I have a thing for asymmetry. Um, you can see a uh, swelling along the seams as these forms come together. And there are kind of mounds and bulges that are very suggestive of, of different genders, they're sensual works. And I found as I made them that I, I found a tenderness in these pieces that I actually hadn't anticipated really before COVID um, hit. So, Probably my needs changed during that time. And I, I think of these works as occupying a kind of a distinct space, projecting desire for closeness and tenderness into these hybrid objects. It's so again from the same mold, but reversed, so it's upside down. Uh, I just wanna repeat my artist's statement for Cultivate. Um, I ask, what is the question, or what is the relationship of desire to belonging. And what is a pot, even an empty one, if not performing the act of holding? I've designed these vessels to feel as if they're offering themselves tenderness and support. And I like to think that in showing how it is to be held, they extend something of an embrace to the viewer now held in the act of beholding. So there's something like a demonstration going on here. And that's consistent in my work across media. I want to talk a little bit, I want to end by talking about function. Um, for the longest time, I've been working primarily with the vase form. 
And I'll never forget this one uh, session we had where Anila Diaz de Sousa was um, one of my, our cohort was holding one of my pieces and she said, why is this a vase? <laughs> she was very uh, abrupt about that. And uh, I realized I, I didn't have a great answer for her. And um, I think that her point was that such sensual forms invite a touch, but that I had failed to assign them a function that would gratify that desire. So this was something of a contradiction that I needed to consider. Uh, and I'm still considering it. But that's what I think the mentorship for me was really valuable about because it brought me face to face with these questions. So I wanna close with just a hint at some of the experiments I'm now conducting and they will be uh, centered around a cup form. I've heard many people say that a cup is a great way to begin. And I remember Angelo also saying that the creative process begins with an opening and over time you move into it, you mine it, refine it, and it, it may begin to narrow. And when you begin to feel constrained by it, perhaps you, you have the urge to open out again. Um, and so it moves between these actions of opening and narrowing and refining, kind of renews itself the process, starting over and over again. Um, so I, I just want to take a moment and thank everybody, uh, Adeline, for proposing these talks. It was a great experience for me to reflect and actually digest everything that, that occurred um, to Barb and Fusion and Silvana Nicchetti for uh, providing this mentorship to Ontario artists working with clay. It's been an incredible privilege. Uh, Karina Bates of Amami, Ontario, she allowed me to stay at her farmhouse so that I could wake up refreshed and ready to work uh, in Millbrook. And I really appreciate that. And to my cohort who were all amazing. I was in great company. And of course, to Angelo for being a master teacher who gave us all the opportunity to look deeply into our own meanings to build an understanding that will continue to renew and reinvent our practice for years to come. So thank you. And now I will introduce Ekta Trinikins. Hi, <laughs> that was great, Jason, thanks. Let me set up my screen. Okay. Hi everybody. Um, I'm Ekta Trinikas. Uh, I will share with you my experience with the Creative Directions program. Um, I've been working on the set that these cups come with, and the mentorship was a good experience for me as it meant getting serious about my work with clay. As long as I can remember, I've been making things, um, and I enjoy working with all kinds of materials and have previously focused on painting for quite a while. I briefly studied theater design and uh, continued with art education and later also South Asian studies. As you can tell, I have been changing subjects quite often in my studies because I even studied some nursing and city planning for a while. And the same as in my art where I have changed and mixed materials often before. In both cases, this has been a source of frustration but also of great inspiration. As all these different places, people, experiences and materials somehow and with some effort eventually come together in my work. I think growing up in two places that couldn't be any more different from each other, the Netherlands and India, played a role in this preference of extremes and change. This here is uh, the couple part. This is one of the gates to my hometown. Um, I'm showing you these pictures as they are part of what I wanted to work with for this set. Mostly this medieval map and similar maps of other cities, um, but certainly also the architecture and the overall feel of being in such a place. This is the 
conservation set I developed during the program. Um, I'm usually a hand builder and I think I feel I took a big risk in deciding on the slip casting method. But I really wanted to use the opportunity to try something new. And these much cleaner and angular lines uh, are new for me. And they refer to the medieval architecture um, and city structures. Other inspirations in this set were water defense systems and Gothic towers. The tower you see on the left here is, is a Gothic tower. Uh, it stands in my home city of Amersfoort. It's hard to tell from this picture, but on the upper corners, you can see uh, gargoyles. Um, and these gargoyles are what inspired the spout of my jug here. That's what they remind me of. This tower was an important landmark in my teenage years. And in a way, it also symbolizes otherness for me as the tower is both part of and also separate from the community. Kind of a place where two worlds can meet. I started working with clay five years ago, a little bit longer maybe, and very quickly took off with this amazing material. I had some encounters with it before uh, and always had a very strong attraction to it, but felt limited by my lack of knowledge and equipment that I thought you would all need to work with clay. In a way, you could say it was almost opportunistic that I only got serious once I had access to both. When I moved close to the Waterloo Potter's workshop, where these were both easily available. I have no formal training in clay at all, but have learned so much by working and experimenting alongside potters of all levels in this very welcoming community. This is work I made before joining the mentorship. Um, and like many of us, um, I started by taking a few courses in wheel and in hand building at the local guild. A few years later, I became an active member um, especially in the beginning, I was interested in working with textures and colors, much in the way I would work with textiles or paint. Most of my work was functional during this time, vases, bowls and plates. I have always experimented with whatever material I have at hand, but what I think helped me develop my skills most during this time is the production that was needed to join the guild sales twice a year. They have a big sale where you can sell your, your homemade pottery uh, to the public. For that, I had to make multiples of everything. And while making those multiples and tweaking them on the way is a real great way to get over failures pretty quick and move on with the next piece with a much better understanding of what you're doing. This is a great hands-on way to learn. And I think in clay, that's probably the best way. Um, I also occasionally started making sculptural work um, which I enjoyed as much or even more than the functional work. I have continued doing both. This here is my basement studio where I'm also sitting right now. Um, I did most of my work during the pandemic here. In normal times, I usually work in the community studio. Um, though I still also now prefer making bigger things at home as I can leave it out and work on it whenever I need to. It is a simple studio space, just a room, um, no running water, just a bucket in the back <laughs> um, and a small window, but it works well. Um, I did all my slip casting from home too, as with the timing in between stages, it works so much better for me to be nearby instead of driving up and down to the, to the workshop. Um, glazing, I find too messy to do at home. So that is something that I almost always do at the community studio. Um, it's much easier to clean up there. Working at home certainly has its advantages, but they don't measure up to working together with other artists. I realize I really need the possibility to share and discuss my work with others. Uh, and that's one of the reasons I really enjoyed the mentorship so much. Well, risks I took with slip casting. Here are a few examples of you know, the disasters that happened. Um, I think it's always good to challenge yourself and try new things when the opportunity comes, but I really had no idea what I was getting into. Um, you can work with the cast pieces pretty much um, in the same ways as with hand building, but some things really don't work. Um, I tried all the available slips in combination with my ideas and it was a good experience and it did work out in the end. 
Um, but I think it, I'm certain it would take a lot more of time and experimenting to feel fluent in this technique, especially uh, in mold making. Here is a overview of the changes uh, my approach has been through um, during the mentorship um, from very wildly slipped and paint hand built jugs or carved jugs like solid carved jugs to to head to uh, slab building to slip casting um, so it became more refined the final shape and form um, with the cups too i have experimented a lot with uh, shape and surface it's almost like a little historic evolution that happened here as i started with pinching um, then slab, carving, um, and then slip casting. Um, just wheel is missing. Sorry. <laughs> Here are a few of the details of the earlier trials I made um, with paper resist on the left and a lot of slip, layers of slip. Um, and I really like that idea with the wall cracks with wall flowers coming out. I didn't use those in the end, but I'm pretty sure I will use them elsewhere when appropriate because I still really like those ideas. Um, this was the set uh, oh, that I um, ended up with. Um, in the final set, um, water, pots, and green areas were reduced to minimal representations. The handle, though it's also slip cast, looks hand built. And the tray actually is hand built. What surprises me most about my own final work was the realization that my landscape has evolved to a more North American one, spacious and empty instead of tiny and filled with details. There is space and emptiness that is quite opposite of what I initially thought of doing and also usually do. I'm of the more is more uh, camp. Now it's more quiet, like the still water around the city. So really. Like. This is some other work um, I made at the same time while being part of the fusion mentorship. Um, for me, generating ideas has never really been a problem, but more managing them, selecting and deciding to focus uh, and work on one aspect, that's really been a challenge for me. I just really like to keep my options open, I guess. This mentorship helped me achieve more of that much needed focus and refinement. This was probably the longest time I have ever worked on one single idea. And the, the one thing that helped me most was to start with a very wide interpretation of the idea, like Jason just spoke about, um, try all of it and then narrow it down to the essence. And once you are there, uh, a million new possibilities come um, that are all in connection to the original idea. Um, this, um, things here you see I made them because um, the slip casting to me felt a little bit restrictive um, and I realized that though that gives me my much needed structure and focus uh, I had a stronger need to work intuitively um, I hope to combine these things in the future though um, for now I have decided to revisit some of my old ideas with this new approach I learned during the mentorship with Angelo this is um, my last project. I, I started doing this after finishing the mentorship program. It's a public art installation with five fish. It's just installed in Waterloo right now uh, and will continue to be displayed for this month, month of July. Um, it was initiated by the city of Waterloo in celebration of Canada Day. Um, here also I propo proposed this just because I wanted to challenge myself and this time by working bigger. Um, I think this has a little play here. <laughs> thank you for joining me. And also thanks to Angelo for running this great program and everybody else involved um, in this mentorship. Um, I will now call back on stage all my friends, Daniel, Jason and Barbara. If you guys are there, yes. <laughs> okay, stop share.
Wow. That was great. Everybody, it's so interesting to see what you did and where you came from and where you ended up. I, I just, I'm always amazed. Well, I'm looking to see if we have any uh, questions in the chat. I don't see any right now, but I have a few. Um, of course, it's a bit of the elephant in the room, but uh, in every artist's creative journey, obstacles present themselves. You have kids, Christmas comes every year, go back to school, jobs. Um, how do you feel the impact of COVID? I can know from my experience what we went through really impacted your creative process. Do you want to comment that? How about Jason? You got a comment on that one and maybe we can hand it over. <laughs> maybe I'm putting you on the spot. Yeah. Not fair, but it was tough. Yeah, well, it was a mixed bag. You know, actually I, for me, it, um, it really freed me. Uh, I, I lost my job, I got the CERB and I went directly into my studio and just started cranking. Um, I, it was very liberating uh, to have that kind of focus. It was only much later that it started to, you know, weigh on me. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, I remember a meeting that we had as a group where we all kind of came back together again after having not seen each other for so long and listening to other people's experiences, what they had been going through was, you know, very humbling. And uh, yeah, I began to see it in a different light. But uh, yeah, so I would say all over the place, but it's, it certainly had a profound effect. Yeah. Anybody else want to comment on that? Danielle? Yeah. It, yeah, it was a different experience having, I mean, I think when we first got locked down, uh, I was just like packing up ready to go to the one of a kind show for the first time in Toronto. Oh, yeah, yeah. And uh, the world got shut down and and all like the few shops and things that my work was at were being shut. So it, like out of an abundance of caution, I right away opted to go back to teaching full time for a year. And, and then we also have three kids like uh, that are in elementary school. So it ended up being a really busy year. I was able to set aside a lot of my functional work um, that I was doing before just because things weren't open anyways and focus on creative directions when I had time. And I think I'm, I think also like, I'm just old enough to realize that this too will pass. You know, I, you know, if I was 20 and that happened, it might've, it might've been a different reaction, but you know, I, I'm not 20 anymore. And so I just viewed it as this is one year, you know, go back to teaching full time. And I'm happy to say that next year I will not be, and I'll be back in the studio half time. Oh, that's but great. It, yeah, but we survived it. It was a different experience with kids at home for sure. Way less time in the studio. I'm asking a question before we have to wrap things up, but um, Ekta, um, what was I going to say here? Oh, if there was one takeaway um, that you will have forever in your creative toolbox, what would that be? Hmm. <laughs> I put on the spot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I, <laughs> there's too many takeaways. You, you know, one thing I would say, my observation is play. Yes, that was always yeah. part of the deal, yeah. Yeah, any other comments from anybody else? How about you, Jason? Um, I mean, it's probably related to play. It's just the idea of mixing it up, you know, of, of doing something that you haven't done before or trying to reflect and, and see what your own limitations are. Um, 
because habits develop over time. Yeah. You know, and you, uh, without actually taking a pause and looking at them and evaluating whether or not they're serving you, you know, it um, just diminishes what you're capable of, so. I have a question in the um, Q&A from an uh, anonymous person saying, hello, Ekta. Thank you for your great talk and sharing your artworks. Really impressive. I have a question to ask you. You mentioned about changing practice and feels to finally reach to the point, to this point with clay. Do you have any advice for people who are similar to you who like to change constantly, do things constantly? Mm -hmm. I, I think it's worth it to really dive into something deeply um, because you end up uh, getting so much more out of it than changing. Changing has a lot of um, benefits too because you have so many different experiences and exposures. But I mean, this with clay is, is when I really uh, got serious about one material and one technique. But before when I studied South Asian studies, that was my first experience of really going into a small topic for a long time. Uh, this was not art related, but I think it's really um, worth the, the time and effort to, to do that for a change. <laughs> Someone's asking here, Victor Brecht is acting. How about you, Daniel? Ask this, uh, answer this one. When was the moment you fell in love working with Clay and why? I think you kind of answered that in your presentation. And anyone who is feeling comfortable enough to answer, um, also, where would you, also, where would a new career sculpturist find, oh, mentorships and residences in Ontario? Oh, she's asking me to type an answer from that. Well, you have to kind of look online. They're hard to find different mentorships and things like that. Um, actually, I see another question here about when the next mentorship will be. Um, here's one from Andrea Fulton. Did any of you experience any resistance to change? Danielle? Yes. <laughs> uh, I think changing at any point can be difficult. Um, although it's so fun to learn new techniques, to actually apply them to your own work, um, you can feel a little rigid in the way you already know how to do something and you've already had good feedback about that. Um, but being part of a group, I believe, really helps in uh, that you get that feedback right away on what's working, what's not. And um, having a teacher like Angelo he does know when to push like he gently did it but he did push all of us to do something different than you're already doing you know what what is your purpose of being here and um i believe after watching our first one and also this presentation i believe all the artists came to that point where they were able to push to a new area of their work and be proud of what they came to. Um, oh, Lauren Arrively just wanted to tell Ekta that she has one of your cups and she enjoys using it immensely. Thanks. Um, interesting. Um, in your creative process of generating ideas, we're gonna have one more question here because um, we're running over time here, but in your creative process of generating ideas, how did you decide what to discard along the way? And what did you find, how did you find like that, per, that focus to pursue? Like, well, how did you know which direction to pursue? And finding that, does that make sense? How did you know what to throw away? I think that's the big thing. And then direct your thing. Jason, you're pondering that. For me, I, I think what was helpful was the uh, idea of the show, actually, um, mm. because you know you had it in mind that this would be exhibited somehow, and you had to think about producing a series of things that would have a relationship to one another. So, you know, that kind of helped me prune and direct you know, what what I was doing. It became clear what had potential for a series and variation so yeah angelo really did push the functional aspect did anybody try to resist that the functional 
um, had to have purpose, I guess, or mm -hmm. a little bit. Yeah. Hard to want to. Uh, Andrea Volton also commented that it was a beautiful evolution of work and thank you to all of you. Um, I think we're at 2.05 now and I would like to say a few thank yous to people, um, particularly to the Gardner Museum um, that, oh, that works endlessly to support and promote glass artists and play people locally, nationally, internationally, um, and Adeline, who just works tirelessly to, to get this exhibition online and in her, in her shop. Um, I also really wanted to thank Angelo, who uh, stayed with it the whole way through, and all the artists who never gave up and who stayed focused and calmed and always available. Um, thank you to Fusion, the Ontario Clean Glass Association, uh, and all the other arts organizations who so generously supported this program over the years. Uh, we just couldn't have done it without everybody. And just a small, short thank you to uh, Deb Freeman, our great executive director, uh, Janan Longman, who handles all our social media and website, and Sylvana McKetty, and the whole board of directors. They work hard to make these programs happen. So it's not a one-man show, believe me. Thanks so much to everybody. And back to Adeline. Thank you so much, Barbara, and thank you all for joining us. Um, it has been a long while since till we get here. I remember Barbara coming to me um, proposing this, and I was like, "Oh yes, this is great!" And <laughs> oh, we have so much time, and you know, and as the time passed, and then we were going to that point of like to that end point of like, okay, the the show's coming here, and then of course, you know, COVID hit, and um, we see these artworks like as the finished product, right? Um, and we enjoy them, we look at them, but through these artist talks, we actually like see the process and the journey, right? And it is, it's such a journey to get there uh, yeah. creatively, right? How to make it, uh, what inspires you to make it? Do you have that inspiration to make it? And I, each of these artists, so Angela, you did like an incredible job of mentoring each artist. So Claire, Anila, Hannah for the first talk, I remember watching it, I was like so into it where I was like, okay, I got to remember where to prompt, <laughs> where it's just because it was just such a, a story of what each artist told. Um, and then Danielle, Jason, and Exa for this talk. It's when uh, Danielle um, said, you know, like there's like this push, you know, a push to make something and for to, uh, Jason mentioning that um, to make something for the exhibit, it kind of puts into perspective of like what your goal is and this end goal, I mean, all of you guys did such a beautiful job. Um, and Christina and Juana who are also part of the exhibiting artists, like thank you. I know that Christina made some extra cups and Juana, um, she uh, delivered her pieces earlier on behalf of her, um, her colleagues. And then Sylvana, um, she's not only part of the uh, exhibiting artists, but she really is like this key supporting point behind the scenes for all the artists um in their journey of just like like talking through like making things and then like going through the artist talks and uh and personally for me for like the shop she really has been like this kind of this key um and then uh barbara and fusion thank you so much for allowing the gardener shop to host this exhibit it's been truly a pleasure and also um you've set a really um a high bar so i i thank you for that Wow. And then uh, the gardener, um, so Rachel, um, uh, with the marketing and Tara for all the art design, making the decals and the e-catalog and uh, Pink Social for all the social uh, media posts and Richard for that IT uh, support, definitely uh, IT support that I, uh, we can all call on. So it, it does, it takes like such a group effort for everyone to um, make this what it is, right? Um, and I just thank each and every one of you guys. It's been truly a pleasure. And I I'm glad we're um, ending this on a very lovely and positive note and that um, we do still have a few weeks left. So if anybody still wants to see it, they can. <laughs> um, and I thank you. I thank you, everybody. Thank you very much, Adeline. All right, thanks. Bye. Bye.